Hello. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, glad you guys made it. I, we appreciate your patience and appreciate your flexibility. I know last week was an interesting week or a tough week for, for the whole state, uh, but we really appreciate all your, your effort and your time, and I appreciate being a part of this. I've been working with um, the administration just to prepare this uh, and Mr. Thomas getting ready for today, but we know it was, a, it was a tough week, and we appreciate you guys being flexible and being committed and making time for this because it's an important issue, important uh, process as well. So we want to just remind you, uh, again, just some general, uh, to honor the chart, stay on topic. Uh, kind of, the, you guys have been reminded of these, these rules as we've gone on. And again, we want to keep in mind uh, mutual respect for everyone. We're, you all are going to have a chance, or some of your, your colleagues are going to present on your, your opinion and your position about how you uh, believe schools or facilities, whether they should be renamed or not. We want to respect everyone's opinion. We want to respect their perspective. We want to be professional. We want to be um, thoughtful of everyone, what they're saying, and again, civil um, and professional as best we can. Uh, we appreciate everyone doing that and, and working hard to do that. Again, at the end, we will uh, have uh, your opportunity to vote on what are going to be ultimately recommendations in terms of what you, what your perspective and what you believe should be done. And those recommendations will be presented to the Board of Trustees next Monday, March 1st. And at that meeting, the entire board will hear the work that's been done from the beginning of the process to where we are now to what's being presented to them. Um, we believe that we've done the best we can with your help and your input to have a good process, to have solid input from everyone to get a good feel for where this community and this committee stand with regard to these issues. Uh, let's see, next. Um, again, uh, making sure that we're, we're just keeping the community respectful of each other and civil, as you all know, is important. So you all should have a packet of the agenda and a packet of some of the information that will be shared tonight. Um, we're going to proceed with having the administration assist. Mr. Thomas, is there anything you want to say before we go on to the surveys and the administration moving? Okay. So now the administration will give us some feedback on how the survey results turned out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Resendez. So, uh, so you, we emailed out survey data that was almost complete we wanted to head it wanted to go ahead and get it in your hands and so you you should have received an email with a, a lot of slides so it was a community survey a staff survey and then a high school all students and then the three uh, schools combined for the, the the three traditional high schools and so hopefully you had a chance to look at that um, so we received a few more responses probably a little less than a hundred total from the time we sent that out until the uh, cutoff time and so what I want to do is just real quick run through that data um, I'm assuming that you've seen it and that there wasn't hardly any change between what I sent you and what I'm showing you up here you also have the PowerPoint slides if you want to take a look at those as well but we wanted to just spend a little bit of time just walking you through the data real fast and so for our uh, community uh, survey results we had uh, a little over 2,000 participants uh, 23 27 Complete it. We, we actually had over 3,000 complete the survey from the community. About 25% of those individuals did not reside in our boundary and about 75% did. And so we're showing you the, the results from those who resided in Goose Creek boundary. Um, for staff, we had almost 700 staff members complete the survey. And then for high school students, as a reminder, we only did the high school, we only surveyed high school students. Um, and we had almost 3,000, around 3,000 completed. And you can see the pie graph here, but GCM had about 1,100 responses. Sterling had 950, Lee had 940, and then the other three high schools had a much smaller response, of course, because they're much smaller in size. Okay, so the first question. Pull this off. Okay, so the first question is, do you feel there's a need to change the name of one or more facilities in Goose Creek CISD? And so the community results, 72% said no, 19% uh, said yes, and 9% said no preference, okay? For the staff survey, same question, um, 
do you feel there is a need to change one or more facilities in Goose Creek? 61% of Goose Creek staff said no, 24% said yes, and then 15% said no preference. And then for the students, this is all the students combined. If you wanted to see a specific school that was emailed to you separately, um, just for the sake of time, we're not going to go school by school, but, but I do, do want to show you the combined results. Just a little bit of difference here. 52% said no, so this percentage was a little bit higher for staff and community. Um, no preference was much higher for students than um, staff or community at 30%. And then um, I think that says 19% or 18% said yes. I think our focus is a little off. Sorry. There we go. It's 18%. My eyes are getting older. Okay. Um, so, so the next question was, if you selected yes, which facilities do you feel like uh, sh should be renamed? And very similar to the conversations we've had over the last three months, um, the community, the staff, and the students um, echoed that sentiment. And so uh, over 400 community members picked Lehigh School, and then it, then it drastically reduces for all of the other facilities. Sterling, if you want to do it by place. Sterling came in second place on this question, um, a little over 100, and then it then it tapers off. And you can look at that um, on your computer, or if you can see it on the slide, I know it's really small there. For the staff, um, similar uh, sentiment, 163. Those who selected yes, this is only those who selected yes, picked the facility, so 163 said uh, Lehigh School, and then Sterling, around 40, 44, and then it, again, it starts tapering off what with the other facilities, uh, quite, quite a bit less. And then for students, for those who selected yes, 475, Sedley High School, and then again, Sterling is a, is a distant second, and then the schools start to taper off. The students picked Horse Man third, we, did, we didn't see that, and then Goose Creek Memorial, so uh, I thought that was interesting, but it just may be their perspective again. Okay, so for the, there's three more questions. And so for the next question, uh, for those who selected yes, what is a primary reason facility name should be changed? And so that the, the response that was the highest for the community um, who selected yes, uh, the community members who selected yes at 54%, they said that the name was offensive. So that was the, that was the biggest response. And then you can see the other responses below. For the staff, it's the same, same outcome. Uh, the number one reason for renamed is the name was offensive at 50%. And then for the students, uh, same outcome. Uh, I believe the school name is offensive at 47%. Okay, so we're, we're definitely seeing a, a trend amongst the three groups. And then with, uh, when I say three groups, the community, the staff, and the students. And then for community results, primary reason why the facility should not be changed, also we see a very similar trend. And so the, the, for the community, 46% said, I believe changing the name would result in loss of tradition. And so that was the number one reason why the name should not be changed. For the staff, it's the same result um, I, for, for, for the first place. I believe uh, the name would result in loss of tradition at, at 41%. And then for students, same outcome at, at 53%. Um, that, that's the number one reason. You can see the, the other reasons as well, but I'm just hitting the highlights. Uh, so 53% said, uh, I believe the name would result in loss of tradition. Okay. The last question that was asked is, which of the following do you consider important and meaningful regarding your school experience, spirit, or pride? Select all that apply. And so you can kind of go through this list and, and see what was rated high versus low. Um, I'll read off the first three for each category. So for community survey results, um, supportive faculty and staff was the highest percentage at 17%, and then school name, and co-curricular, extracurricular tied for second for, for the community. And then, then it tapers off a little bit. Not a big difference between the, the, all the reasons, actually. 17% um, is the highest, and then 12% is the lowest. For staff, um, same, similar outcome, similar outcome. The, the, the number one reason is the same. Supportive faculty and staff is at 18%. And then co-curricular and extracurricular activities is at 16%, and then peer relationships uh, was at 15%, okay? And then for student surveys, um, same first, for, well, well, these first two are also the first two for staff. So students at 17% each, 
selected supportive faculty and co-curricular and extracurricular for the for the first year responses and then peer relationships was third okay so that is the data in a nutshell um, i can send you more information if you're interested in it on that data um, we did send out the open-ended responses as you saw there were there were many open-ended responses that were shared and so um, with that i think we're going to transition to the presentation so i'm going to hand the mic over to our chairperson at this time the community and the staff and the student gave us their input and we saw that input but also this committee's job is also to provide a recommendation so we have several outcomes that were listed at the beginning that we're working through and one of the outcomes is that the committee gives a recommendation so that's the reason why well i mean that, that's why we're doing the work is because there were outcomes that were set in place and some of that outcome involves feedback from the community and we know what that feedback is but the community still has to finish the the job that we were told to do which is to knock out those outcomes and those guiding questions Yes, sir. Yeah, so in the final report, and Thomas is going to talk about that at the end, and I think Tony is too, but in the final report, all the data that we have here is all public information, and so we're also putting that out in the final report, and it'll be on the website. Okay. All right, good evening, everybody. So we're going to get into the presentations real quick. I do want to ask uh, that as we, as our presenters work through their presentations, that you allow them to make their presentations without interruption. Uh, you may not agree with what's being presented uh, one way or the other, but uh, these people have volunteered their time and efforts to, to create these presentations. It was a very time consuming process. I know I spoke with uh, members of, of both sides of all of these. So uh, please allow them the respect to get through their presentation. They are time limited. I believe we have note cards that we're gonna pass out that uh, if you do have a question, we ask that you fill out the note card and hand it in to a staff member. That way uh, we, can, we can sort through that and if time allows, we'll, we'll allow for some of these questions to be read off and answered. Presentation for uh, some of the, uh, the Texas related elementary schools, I believe, in several facilities. Uh, then we're going to for Sterling and Lee High School, and then there's a group that's going to make, be making the case against renaming uh, the facilities as a combined presentation. So, uh, oh, that's right. I guess I'm going first, actually, uh, because uh, one of the uh, facilities that we talked about or that was, uh, that was voted on to discuss at this meeting was uh, the Green Center. Uh, our, at our previous meeting, we did make a uh, recommendation to the board that we not allow for duplicate facility names and considering recent events where uh, the school district has decided to use EF Green as the name for our new junior high number six, uh, that is now a duplicate name for the Green Center. So I believe that our committee should make the recommendation to the board that the Green Center be renamed. So I rest my case in 30 seconds. Uh, just, just so that everybody's aware, we did a, a lot time limits for the different presentations. For uh, the Texas schools, we allotted six minutes for, six minutes against renaming. For Sterling, we allotted six minutes for, six minutes against. And for Lee, because we knew that that was a more in-depth presentation, we allotted 10 minutes for and against. Uh, some groups ask that their presentation times be combined to uh, avoid a, a repetitive argument. So we have allowed that for both uh, Lee and Sterling on the four renaming and then all of the uh, keep the name side. So uh, the first presentation will be six minutes. The second presentation will be 16 minutes and the third presentation will be 22 minutes. We're keeping the time up here on the iPad for the presenters. Uh, and it will be strictly adhered to you, so. All right. I am honored to serve on this committee. I have been fortunate to spend my entire educational career in Goose Creek and Barbara's Hill, working for the best administrators and with colleagues dedicated to creating compassionate classrooms while providing quality education for our children. And I have never worked with a more com compassionate group committed to working for social justice 
and creating a better, more thriving, and inclusive community than my fellow committee members. I began my teaching career at James Bowie Elementary and library career at Stephen F. Austin Elementary. I have lived in Baytown for almost 50 years and am a GCCISD taxpayer. Both my mother, class of 52, and my daughter, class of 94, are Robert E. Lee graduates and were members of the brig and the band, respectively. Both my children are products of Goose Creek CISD. My paternal grandparents were born in Cherokee Territory, Oklahoma. My maternal grandmother was born in Jersey City, New Jersey, as her parents had just immigrated from Castile, Spain, speaking no English except the words standard oil. My great-grandfather, who you see here, Joseph Cassio, helped build the Baytown Refinery and lived in the tent cities with his family until permanent housing could be built. He was not eligible to purchase an East Baytown home because, although he was a Spaniard, he was designated as Mexican. From the Humble Bee, Volume 3, Number 6, August 3, 1925, Subsection 3, Restrictions, and I quote, The lots will be sold only to whites. That is, it will be restricted against Mexicans, Chinese, Japanese, and others, except members of the white race. And these restrictions will be made continuous, end quote. My maternal grandfather retired from Humble Oil and Refining Company after 40 years as a chemist and laboratory supervisor. He was instrumental in getting the first junior high started in Baytown and was president of an early school board. And that's from the Baytown Sun, September, uh, September 13, 1978, page 10A. So why is my particular family story relevant? Everyone has his or her own particular family story. The experiences and treatment of my family members were generally accepted as the norm at the time they took place. We no longer live in those times. To acknowledge that we no longer live in those times is not to admit, is not to omit or dispel history, but to ignore it in this day and time, it is to ignore the ever-evolving nature of how we relate to one another. How we relate to one another is not fixed in the past. We choose every single day how we relate to one another. Thank goodness, as we grow, we can use the wisdom that we gained to make progress in coexisting with one another in our cherished democracy. I recommend the names of the following elementary schools be changed. Asheville Smith, Stephen F. Austin, David Crockett, William B. Travis, and James Bowie, because the namesakes were either slave owners or slave traders, according to the Handbook of Texas Online. And you all have a copy of my research. Our country was founded on land taken from the Native Americans and prospered on the labor of slaves and immigrants. Two ideas of government, oligarchy, where resources and ruling are held by the self-appointed elite and democracy of the people, by the people, for the people, have been wrestling for dominance for centuries. Ever since people were brought to these shores enslaved, robbed of their dignity, and subjected to cruel and inhumane treatment. People are afraid. Their fear and uncertainty has been weaponized to create an enemy to blame for all their troubles economic, personal, local, religious, workplace, etc. People are afraid of losing their power over others. We can create a culture of power with and power to, not power over. The idea of forced races was a construct of colonialism and imperialism. Since it was man-made, it can be deconstructed. Only one race was created the human race. At the DNA level, we are 99.99% alike. We are all shades of tan. I am lighter, but I have shades of pink and peach. Only this paper is white. 
yet you will notice it provides no meaning or no value until I add the letters, the words, in black. Together we can create a meaningful life using our time, talent, and treasure for the greater good. Society is based on you and me. Justice is what love looks like in the public arena. Why should we change the names? The most important reason I can think of is this. It will be a concrete way to demonstrate that Baytown is a growing and thriving and forward-moving 21st century community. People use history to criticize different thinking. History is often a distorted window into the past, the perspectives of those with power to tell it. Stories matter, words matter, names matter. You all have my research. Dr. Martin Luther King. Okay. Talking about why Robert E. Lee and Ross S. Sterling should be changed. Uh, so how do we get here? Uh, the main thing for Ross S. Sterling, if you go back and research Baytown, Texas, you'll see that we were founded on Merchant, then got a big boom from oil. Uh, in the 1900s, early 1900s, you can see that that was the boom of Confederate monuments, statues, schools, and things of that nature. To understand this, you have to go back to what was happening during this time in history. All right. One of the things that I want to talk about, I'm not going to read all the definitions, but my goal and why we change is because I want to be a community that is anti-racist. Anti-racist says a form of action against racial hatred, bias, systemic racism, and the oppression of marginalized groups. All right, it's usually structured around conscious efforts. That means we're actively trying, not trying to call anyone a racist or say that you study ideal white supremacy, but I want to know that you're making a social conscious effort to fight against racism. Right. Robert E. Lee, right. the land was built on land owned by the KKK. All right says that a gala barbecue held at the present site of Robert E. Lee High School illustrates the openness of Klan operations in the community. All right. We don't see anybody walking around with hoods anymore. All right. Nowadays, they just hide behind social media and spew their racial remarks. All right. But if you go back to the history, what I want to do is have you construct a house. And when you're building a house, your house is nothing if you don't go and check your foundation. Our foundation was built on racist, bigot principles, and it was embedded throughout the school districts, throughout the police force, and if you don't think that traditions matter, just go back and see what you ate for Thanksgiving. None of us would consider ourselves pilgrims, but I bet you had turkey, corn, and all these other things that are considered traditional. So these things are interwoven in our society. So to think that they don't exist or they might not have affected you, they do affect many people, and that's where the word systemic comes from. This was typical in Baytown. Klansmen rolling up, you know, doing what they do. It was business as usual. Ross S. Sterling was said to be a known member of the KKK, and they had an article in the Baytown Sun where they requested that him and 20 other people get their people in line because it was becoming too violent towards blacks and even Hispanics in Baytown. This is normal. So my primary reasons, one is to stop the continuation of honoring the Confederacy and white supremacist ideologies. All right? We can no longer celebrate slaving, typically of my ancestors. It doesn't make me proud and the symbolism of Robert E. Lee is deeply embedded into our country. This isn't just the issue that's going on in Baytown. All right. The majority of all places of Confederate leaders are being changed across the nation. And we're in the process of being the last stronghold for the Confederacy. I don't want my kids to grow up in that type of area. All right. Ku Klux Klan says they dominated the town, politically, socially, and economically. That's a big reason why the name was chosen for Robert E. Lee. People needed a hero. Daughters of the Confederacy 
were seeking to find someone that they could rally behind, and it was to keep racial hierarchy in check. They didn't want people that were not white to receive any power. Traditions. I know many of you love the Brigadiers. I'm pretty sure at this time, Lee Brigadiers were just marching with the Confederate flag. I think this time this is what gets people upset when they talk about, you're trying to take my culture, my heritage. And that's not true. No one's trying to steal your culture or your heritage. But I want you to think about the symbolism that it represents now. It's in Baytown. Skinheads, white power t-shirts. This is something that's embedded into our fabric. That's at a park. The same ideology is represented by the name Robert E. Lee to many people. Number two, it's morally right. The practice of naming schools, especially those named after Confederate soldiers, defenders of the slavery, was part of a larger effort to maintain the racial hierarchy that we're talking about. It doesn't belong in our schools, especially schools that are predominantly minority. This is not a new, a new thing. Many people on the committee will argue, everyone's just saying this because it's going on national media. We don't need to be followers. This has been talked about since the 1930s, and it's documented, and we're going to get to those. Another reason is that Robert E. Lee was a traitor. He committed treason. He fought against this country. I'm from, uh, you know, I'm a gander. I thought we celebrated winners. Why is it that someone who had treason, who wasn't even welcome back in his home state, right, honored with the memorial of a high school? Next thing, I know there's a big sense of nostalgia. We're changing history. History can't be changed. Memories aren't going to be lost. No diplomas are changed. Colors and mascots can remain the same. All, right. All we're asking is for it not to be a Confederate general. We want to be a community that's anti-racist. To represent history not being changed. I hear people talking about people being at games and doing things. I'm at those games. They're empty. All of this outcry about people coming to support students is a lie. I support those students regularly, not just when it's time to come and talk about changing the name, but on a consistent basis. All the time, if you look, I wanted this for specifically, the only one that has Lee on the shirt is me. There won't be money spent on this. Those shirts say ganders. I bleed maroon and white. I don't support Lee. The common misconception is that because people want the name changed, they don't love their school. That's absolutely false. I love my classmates. I love the school. I had a great time. Changing the name will not change any of that. Erasing is a term that's used for pencils and erasers. There's nothing that anyone can do to erase history. That's a common talking point that has absolutely no validity. None. We cannot erase this. That happened. I support those students. Love them when I see them. Support them after college. Nothing can change that, even if they change the name. They're still ganders. I'm there supporting the team. I don't see a lot of y'all there. Nothing can change that. The hell might change depending on what they change the name to. But the kids remain the same. And if you look at the kids, majority minority surrounded by a white coach who loves these players. They don't deserve to walk through a building of a man who represented slavery and made crazy statements about him. This is me doing my thing. I've also been a proud member of Goose Creek CISD on the Here We Grow Giants Committee. Regardless of what happens, I'll still love my community and the school. So all of you that think that your nostalgia will be ripped away, that we're taking your culture, your heritage, that's not true. You'll still be able to do 
whatever it is you need to do. Those memories are forever embedded in your heart. There's nothing a name change can do to ever take that away. In conclusion, symbols matter. And if you really want to do the right thing for Robert E. Lee, honor him. This has been going on. These are articles. All right. Asking the school to probe into names. School complaints. Trustees consider to consider requests by Negroes. What happened with those? They reject six out of eight of them, including Confederate flag in the names. It's 1970. Hold an open forum to air views on Robert E. Lee race relations. Don't sit up here and try to spill that this is just something that's been going on. People have asked why there's only a marginalized number of people who want the same or who want the name to change. It's because it's been marginalized people that have been against everything. In a majority society, they probably would have wanted slavery to continue, but someone thought it was morally wrong and did the right thing to help those who couldn't speak for themselves. Once, this was your brigade practice, marching with the rebel flag. I find no ill will in this other than I hate the, the rebel flag but I want you to think about the symbolism that it's become. It's 2017. We say these times are dead, but here they are. Swastikas, rebel flag, insurrection in the White House, I'm sorry, in the Capitol, KKK. The rebel flag is a symbol for hate and bigotry. And Robert E. Lee represents that hate and bigotry. You want to honor him? This is why the name should be changed. He believed that the painful discipline they, blacks, are undergoing was necessary from their instruction as a race. And unfortunately, I have to sit around and hear people tell me that as a black person, I should stop being on TV murdering people. I'm sorry, I'm educated with a master's degree, have a nonprofit very educated and do more community service than most. I don't need to do anything. But that same ideology is embedded into what Robert E. Lee believed. But if you really want to honor him, Robert E. Lee said, I think you're wiser moreover not to keep open the stores of war, but to follow examples of those nations who endeavor to obliterate the marks of civil strife. I won't read both quotes, but to be frank, Robert E. Lee never thought those Confederate statues should be memorialized. He never wanted them. So while you're fighting to keep the name, you're really dishonoring him. Because his legacy, he knew the pain that it would bring. He knew in his wisdom that if we continued to have separate things happen, these things would happen. So if you really want to honor Robert E. Lee, honor his wishes and do what he did and get rid of all confederacy because he wanted it to be one nation. He knew that it would be divided if we continued down this road. But instead of honoring his legacy and doing what he wished, we're doing different. And here we are today, so he had wisdom in his words. He knew that we would be separated. So please take time, think about it, and please do what you can to change the name. My mother is Sarah B. Miller. She is part of the George Washington Carver High School class of 1967, which is the last graduating class of that school. For those that are not aware, GWC was the all-black school during the segregation era here in Baytown. My mother served the community of Baytown for 30 years working at the U.S. Post Office before retiring in 2009. I recently had a conversation with her regarding the naming committee because I wanted to get her perspective about what it was like being raised during that era in Baytown's dark history. She told the stories of being tormented and harassed on Texas Avenue walking with friends by students from Lee High School as they would drive by waving their Confederate flag screaming the N-word and many other stories I will not go into for the sake of time. However, one piece of information that surprised me the most and to be honest, I'm a little embarrassed 
for not knowing this or realizing this in the first place was the black students were the only ones segregated from Lee. The other races were permitted to attend Lee. You may all, you, some may sit and ask, what does that have to do with the name on a building? And I feel that is a fair question. Changing the name does not dissolve the dark past, but it, in, but it vindicates it. I do believe we cannot and should not erase history, good or bad. Instead, we should be educated about it, discuss it, and learn from it. What we should not do is continue to glorify and honor the, the bad parts of our history just to hold on to glory years. I do believe there is a way the name can be removed, but the legacy of the school remain intact. That is the discussion we should be having. We do want to thank everyone for the presentations, but we also want to thank the committee uh, for being respectful and uh, courteous to them. So why don't we all get seated and we get started again, and we want, to, we want the same level of respect and courteous uh, behavior toward this new group and this, all the groups that come up and then ultimately when we vote we want to continue with that so we're going to go ahead and get started and uh, do we have the timer ready all right folks again thank you again we're going to get started um, and let's maintain that level of professionalism and civil discourse and um, okay i think we're ready with the timer and we're ready to go good evening well, here we are. As I look around the room, I see people from different walks of life to represent the voices of our local community. We have all been charged by the district to make a recommendation to the school board based on what our local community wants us to do regarding current and future school names. That's your job. Unlike many of you here, I wasn't raised with an American public education or in this country at all. I'm from Belize, another place with a very diverse landscape like it is here in America. We had slavery. In fact, I'm, I wouldn't be here because I'm a product of a slave master and a slave. So, however, what I did learn from my teachers is that it is dangerous and destructive practice to sanitize history and its flawed heroes. Tradition and heroism is subjective, and the data shows that people still value tradition, flaws and all. As the Yale report says, tradition often carries wisdom that is not immediately apparent to the current generation. No generation stands alone at the end of history with a perfect moral hindsight. I humbly submit to you that the names in our schools, sorry, this thing keeps dropping down, that the names of our schools should also be judged with the same context in the era in which their namesakes lived. And not to be used as a weapon to erase, sanitize, oops, or blindfold history. We must preserve our historical records with the good and the bad in visible ways, not hidden in a book or some obscure dusty corner of a museum. In reality, many of our revered heroes are flawed morally in some way, and if we dig enough, we will always find a skeleton. If we judge one, we will need to judge them all. One might object that the bar of judging a hero isn't that high. They must not be a misogynist. They must not be a racist. They must not be a xenophobe. They must not be this. They must not be that. Those criteria seem like simple criteria to us in the broader culture of 2021. But if you study history closely enough, there are very few historical figures that would meet our, moral, our modern moral standards based on that criteria alone. Our heroes have virtues and vices, and we should strive to honor them more based on their broader principal legacies and the great things they accomplish for our communities and country, not for narrow, high moral standards that we ourselves cannot meet. If you think you could, then you don't really accept the reality that we are all fallible creatures and we all miss the mark. Let's look at some of our revered heroes in history and judge them by our current moral standards. Let's look at Gandhi. He is well known for his principal legacy as the foremost champion for Indian independence, for Brit British imperial rule, and as the great pacifist and leader of the passive resistance movement that African American civil rights leaders emulate, yet he was also a sex addict. He believed in the separatist um, caste system. He was anti-Semite, and if you consider the quote that he did, you know, he thinks Jews should have welcomed their suffering and so they can be faster in the arms of Jehovah. 
consider even Frederick Douglass a rightful American hero. His principal legacy advocated for the abolition of slavery and the equality of black Americans, yet he held same, seemingly racist views of Native Americans. He believed the rights of black Africans were supreme over the rights of Native Americans. So if you can see the quotes he did, let's ask our Native American friends what they think about those standards. Other people with principal legacies and contributions to our country were flawed as well. I submit to you that it's just as morally wrong to judge a person on a single test. We should value the redemptive human spirit. We should approach history with great humility and not with prideful righteousness as if our generation is solely the most enlightened and progressive generation. Even a diamond has flaws in its brilliance. So let's learn about our school's namesakes and historical context and focus on their principal legacies and see them for their great contributions, flaws and all. My topics are Texas. Let's begin with Stephen F. Austin. Stephen F. Austin acted as a land agent or empresario for Mexico at their bidding in 1825 to bring 300 families to um, 300 families to families to colonize Mexico in exchange for land grants, earning him the names Father of Texas and Founder of Texas. Austin's legacy is 5,000 people obtained 1,540 land titles, some of which can still be traced back to the original land grants. The rest of Austin's history is pretty much taught in eighth grade in our public school system. Um, my thing about Austin is, if he hadn't done this, would we be here? Okay, and then we have a, a group of the Alamo heroes. Um, those of some, you know, people don't think they're the same. David Crockett died at the Alamo. He was a pioneer congressman and soldier from Tennessee who was legendary before he left to go to Texas to settle. His defense of the Alamo and subsequent death elevated him to folk hero status. He helped Texans gain independence. If he hadn't helped us gain independence, where would we be? James Bowie, another well-known name, Pioneer of Bowie Knife fame, was also a bit of a legend before he joined the Texas Texian militia and later took over command of the soldiers at the Alamo. Um, he died fighting in his sickbed when the Alamo fell. He came to Texas because he believed in Texas cause and he died a hero. And if he hadn't done what he did, where would we be? William B. Travis, a 26-year-old lawyer and lieutenant colonel led 30 men to join the fight. We wrote a letter, and he wrote a letter asking for help, proclaiming he would fight until the end with the final words, victory or death. Another but popular, popular but unsubstantiated legend has Travis drawing a line in the sand to challenge Santa Anna. Travis was 26 years old. He came because he believed in the cause, and he fought for Texas. And the Alamo, I'm not really going into, everybody knows about the Alamo. I'm not gonna insult your intelligence. And uh, I mean, it's, it's a shrine, and it should be. But the next big thing, and another school name, I went there, San Jacinto. April 21st, 1836, the great battle that ended the war was fought on the other side of the ship channel as families spread from Santa Ana after the fall of the Alamo and the heinous acts at Goliad. This was known as the runaway scrape. Many made it to the other side by sheer will, God's grace, and a little ferry at Lynchburg. The Battle of San Jacinto was the next step to Texas becoming the great state it is today. Texas history is all around us. We live it. These people helped make Texas history they help Texas be who they are today. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for some of these people. And all I can say to that is, God bless Texas. He shaped the destinies of Baytown's leading citizens and guided the progress of the entire state. Ross S. Sterling was born in 1875 in Anahuac, Texas. He was one of 12 children born into a working class family. At the age of 12, he, his father passed away, he had to quit school, and he had to start working in the family 
field to help support them. This was also the beginning of his business enterprises, having started a schooner business with his brothers. Sterling married, had five children, including his namesake, who predeceased him, and he owned what was nicknamed the Little White House, located in Laporte. He died in 1949 and was laid to rest in Houston. He became an oil operator and purchased two nearby wells, wells which developed into the Humble Oil Company. He served as president. He started Humble Oil with one of his brothers and sisters. He took Baytown out of an agrarian society to an industrial society, providing employment to many. The town grew. As a result of Humble Oil, he needed a way to transport products, so he built his own railroad, where he was president and owner. And he didn't stop there. He continued expanding his business enterprises throughout his life. He purchased the Houston Dispatch and Houston Post, which merged into the Houston Post Dispatch, then the Houston Post. He also served as chairman. He established Houston's first commercial radio broadcasting station, KPRC. He acquired one of Houston's leading banks, serving as chairman. He became a real estate developer, including the Houston Post Dispatch building located in Houston, which was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in February of 2002. He helped build Memorial Hospital and served on its board. He served as president of Barossa Sterling Investment Company. He expanded Texas highways and had the legislature pass a weight limit law. And when his personal fortune crashed in the Depression, he came back with Sterling Oil serving as president. In 1930, he decided to run as governor and became the 31st governor of the state of Texas. He served as governor during the Depression. The oil industry was in bad shape. Sterling gave it a needed transfusion. He called on the legislature and forced the adoption of the Texas oil proration system, which prevented waste and years later was to be a major factor in winning World War II. He was chairman of the State Highway Commission and was instrumental in highway development, including the implementation of the 100-foot right-of-way for highways. Much of what Texas today was conceived and put into operation when Sterling was governor. He was president of Houston YMCA, the American Made Flour Mills, chairman of the Houston Harris County Channel Navigation Board, and that's just to name a few. Sterling was very, very active in his community and throughout the state. He also deeded property to a local church. He funded the original Goose Creek Library, which was the first county library in Texas. He made large donations to TCU. He donated land on the Tri-City Beach Road for the Camp Ross S. Sterling Jr. in memory of his son. He donated his LaPorte Mansion, which became a boys' home. There are currently two high school names after him, a middle school, our own Sterling Library, a street name, and at one time the ferries at Bolivar and Lynchburg were named after him. When Sterling passed, it was written, Ross Sterling's career was studded with more deeds of greatness and more demonstrations of a great heart than is generally re realized. At the height of his fame and fortune in the depths of adversity, he was uniformly cheerful and good natured. He was always unassuming and unpretentious. He was loyal and generous to his friends and never failed to keep a promise. And I don't want to touch on this, but the Ku Klux Klan was brought up. <clears throat> in my research, the best I could find was, and it's been rumored, it was apparent or evident. Apparently, evidently, and rumored is not conclusive that he was a member of the Klan in participation or membership. And if all of it takes to destroy a person's name or reputation is a rumor, we are all targets. Robert E. Lee's father had been a hero of the American Revolutionary War and had served as Virginia's governor. When Lee was six years old, his father, tarnished with financial troubles, abandoned the family. From the age of 12, Lee became the caretaker for his ailing mother, who died in 1829. Lee was born in 1803 and died in 1870. In, his, in, in, 1870. in his 63 years on earth, Lee was so much more than a Confederate general. Lee attended West Point, where he graduated second in his class and entered the Distinguished Engineer course. He served in the U.S. Army for 32 years, with four years being superintendent at West Point. After resigning from the U.S. Army in 1861 to defend his native state, Virginia, Lee served in the Confederate Army for four years. After the war, Lee became president of Washington College until his death. From his early life to service in the U.S. Army and president of Washington College, Lee's life was indisputable, exceptional. The time of Lee's life that is contested is his four years as a Confederate general. Despite Lee's flaws, he is worthy of being honored for his part in shaping the world in which we live. We're going to highlight Lee's character and 
his character, his dilemma over leaving the Union, his work in healing the nation after the war, his time spent as an educator, and finally his ties to our great state of Texas. Lee did not want to end up like his father and was very frugal. On one occasion, he wrote to his bank about a discrepancy of $1.20 in his account balance of $841.77. After his father-in-law's death and his exec executor of the will, Lee worked diligently for several years to return the mismanaged estate to profitability. Lee always made sure to pay his debts. During the war, he even sent $2 across enemy lines to pay a blacksmith that he owed. He slept in a modest soldier's tent and ate the same rations as his men. When fresh fruits, vegetables, and other fine foods were sent to his headquarters, Lee would write a gracious thank you letter to the giver and quietly send the food on to his men. After the war, Lee did not want to make money off the sacrifice of others and refused lucrative offers from railway and insurance companies, the Romanian army, and even an offer to move into an English manor house with an annual salary. He also refused to write his memoirs as he didn't think it was right to use others' deaths as a means to get wealthy. Lee, who openly expressed that he did not believe in succession, faced a heart-wrenching decision whether to stay with the Union or go with his native state of Virginia if they succeeded. On April 20, 1861, Lee wrote a letter to his sister in which he explained his anguished decision of resigning from the U.S. Army. In the letter he stated, with all my devotion to the Union and the feeling of loyalty and duty of an American citizen, I have not been able to make up my mind to raise my hand against my relatives, my children, my home. I have therefore resigned my commission in the Army and save in defense of my native state with the sincere hope that my poor services may never be needed. I hope I may never be called upon to draw my sword. After the war, Lee became the chief proponent of reconciliation between North and South. General Grant was correct when he stated, quote, except for a few political leaders, all the people of the South will accept whatever Lee does as right and will be guided to a great extent by his example, unquote. Regarding slavery, Lee wrote, quote, so far from engaging in a war to perpetuate slavery, I am rejoiced that slavery is abolished, unquote. Lee has his first taste of ministering an educational institution from 1852 to 1855 while serving as superintendent of West Point. In 1865, when Lee became president of Washington College, it was in financial ruins. Lee reluctantly accepted the position as he was worried that he might draw upon the college as a feeling of hostility, but also added that, I think it is the duty of every citizen in the present condition of the country to do all in his power to aid in the restoration of peace and harmony. Donations from Washington College's financial recovery came mainly from Lee's Union admirers in New York and other northern states. While serving as president of Washington College, Lee incorporated the Lexington Law School into the college, encouraged the development of the sciences, instituted programs in business instruction that led to the founding of the School of Commerce in 1906. He introduced courses in business and journalism, which were the first offered in the United States of any colleges, oversaw the construction of a new chapel, and established an informal code of conduct of, quote, we have but one rule here, and it is that every student must be a gentleman, unquote, which led to the school's present-day honor system. Arthur Charles Basterlin Floyd wrote that Robert E. Lee's efforts at Washington College entitled him to a position in the first rank of American educators. <clears throat> From 1846 to 1848, Lee distinguished himself in the Mexican-American War while stationed in Texas. For his gallantry in leading efforts to seize or avoid Mexican strongholds, he received three brevets. General Winfield Scott stated success in the Mexican War was largely due to Robert E. Lee's skill, valor, and undaunted energy. From 1855 to 1857, Lee was in charge of the 2nd Cavalry here in Texas protecting the western frontier from widely scattered Indian raids and called Camp Cooper my, quote, my Texas home, unquote. In 1860, Lee returned to San Antonio to assume command of the regiment until February 1861 when Texas declared the secession from the Union. Educator, soldier, and Christian gentleman, Robert E. Lee lived his life with honor, loyalty, and dignity.
The Goose Creek Board of Trustees formed our committee to evaluate if the community feels like there's a need for to change names of facilities and what the impact would be on our students. As part of this process, our committee surveyed three distinct groups, the community, district staff, and the students. I am here to speak about the data. Survey results show that our citizens, staff, and students do not want facility names changed, and the numbers are overwhelming. 71% of the community, 61% of staff, and 52% of students. When asked what is important regarding school experience, these groups agreed that supportive faculty was most important. It was the number one response in all three groups. While school name was number four for students and no higher than number three for the others. Further, when we dig into student <coughs> open-ended responses, we can clearly see that these kids have more on their minds than the name of the school. Responses include bring back strawberry milk, bring back the microwaves, fix grading policies, follow COVID regulations, give more money for football equipment at Ross Sterling. I like donuts, upgrade Stallworth, and many others. Impact on students. The committee was given the opportunity to dive in deeper and explore school names within GCC ISD. We've looked at history, we've looked at cost, precedent, and so much more. We were told by groups of people that school names are a hot topic locally and nationally, and it's time to discuss names on our buildings. So here we are, again. When looking at the bare basics, we have three groups of humans invested, staff, community, and students. The students are the hearts and minds that will be impacted on a daily base basis by school names. They are the ones who will wear the names, sing the names, chant the names, and build lasting memories within the walls of these name buildings for years while receiving their education. When you consider the principles for naming and renaming, the history of our facility namesakes, the will of our community, and the needs of our students, the right choice is to keep these names. Our kids need stability, they need to know that heroes can have flaws, and they need to be taught scholarship and independent thinking. We can provide this here in Goose Creek. Please join us in recommending that we preserve the names of these facilities. Thank you. A question from a uh, citizen, uh, from a community member. So Mr. Thomas is going to read it and then answer it. All right. Uh, thank you. First off, thank you for all of our presenters. Those were all fantastic presentations and you know, put a lot of hard work. So round of applause for everybody. Uh, we had one question. Uh, since only 2,300 community members responded to the survey, Baytown's current population is 76,635. Why are 3% of population who are against name changes allowed to dictate the renaming 97% of Baytown residents? Uh, so. The, the survey results are just one factor that's going to be presented to the board. Uh, our committee was asked to do a more in-depth analysis of naming, renaming, the history of these facilities, uh, and, and we've done that job. Uh, so the, the survey results are the survey results. They're not going to be the decision maker. Uh, it wasn't a uh, you know, it, it wasn't an item on the ballot, but uh, I think they will weigh on, on the decision process. Uh, so just, just know that they're, they're one factor in the process, and it will be our board of trustees who are elected by the uh, residents of Goose Creek CISD districts that will be making the decision. Okay, we want to make sure everybody has a uh, pad to get ready to do the voting. I guess they're being passed out. Raise your hand if you don't have one. Make sure it works. Oh, I, I do want to make one comment about the uh, committee voting process. I, I've, I had several questions asked about the, uh, the scale that we have here. Uh, the, the scale kind of reflects this is a complex decision that we're making on some of these facilities and people may not feel strongly one way or the other. If, if you feel like you want to make an up or down vote uh, personally, 
there's an option of a one or a five that represents how you feel. Uh, if you went through this committee process and, and you came in thinking one thing, but maybe listening to the, the stories that other people had and these presentations tonight, and maybe you've softened your stance or, or you're undecided, uh, the, the two, three, and four represent that ability to, to show to the district that it's a complex decision and there may not be one right answer. So we, we are providing the scale just to, just to allow you some granularity in your decision-making process, but all of the results will be shared with the board. So uh, that's, that's what I want to say regarding the uh, scale. going to talk a little bit about our final reports and then the timing of the presentation. I think we did mention that it's next Monday. Mr. Thomas, do you have anything you'd like to say? Again, we thank everybody uh, for your participation, for your patience, for your commitment to this committee. And I've, I've been honored to help you in the last couple meetings. Um, I know um, we're going to do the best we can to present this information as objectively um, as we can. And Mr. Thomas, I'll let you say a few words. All right, so uh, we're gonna have a draft version of the report that we're gonna send out to committee members. That way we'll be able to review and provide some feedback before uh, Mr. Resendez and I go up before the board next, next Monday, March 1st, uh, to give this presentation. I'd just like to thank everybody for participating in this process. Uh, it's, it's been, you know, difficult at times, but you know, it, it's meaningful, and uh, it's something that we we need to do as a community. And I, I appreciate the school board allowing us the time and the resources to uh, to have this discussion, this important discussion. Yeah. I would just like to again thank you. I thought the presentations were outstanding tonight. I felt like uh, this is probably one of our most productive meetings. Um, I, I hope you learned a lot through this whole process. I learned a lot. Um, it wasn't always, give me one second, I'll call you. Um, it, it wasn't always a pretty process, but um, a lot of people wouldn't go through this. And so I just want to thank you for that. Um, I do want to say these points here. Um, our, com our committee members here, so you represent various uh, segments of our community. And so we wanted to make sure that, that all segments were represented. So I want to thank you for that. And also, I want to thank you for serving on this committee. Your time was evident. Your commitment to our district is evident. Um, we did want to say this. Um, we, we have committee guidelines in place. We want to ask you to continue to follow those guidelines. Um, if the board asks for this committee to reconvene um, or to you know, give additional outcomes, you don't have to do that. Um, you don't have to move forward with this process. But, but if that request is ever made, um, we, we want to make sure that our guidelines are intact so that we can move forward. So again, just, just thank you all for your, for your time and your work. All right, well, thank you all. Have a good night.